The island of the goddess Aphrodite lies in the eastern basin of the Mediterranean Sea. Its climate is extremely pleasant, its scenery diverse. Beautiful beaches, high mountains, idyllic villages, monasteries decorated with Byzantine murals, busy cities, colorful harbors. There's a good reason why Cyprus has become a favorite vacation spot for tourists. Larnaca has become the capital of the island's tourism and the gate to Cyprus for three main reasons. One of these is its favorable location. Tourists can easily reach the beaches of Napa, the capital Nicosia, the Trodos Mountain, or Paphos from here. The second is its international airport, the significance of which has greatly increased since the division of the island. This is where all the charter planes land, while the harbor welcomes the ships arriving from Israel and Arabic countries. This is where the one to two day boat trips to Syria and Lebanon set off. There are no trains on the island, as the only line was demolished in the 50s. However, the road system is of good quality and public transportation is highly developed. Tourists can also use share taxis or rent cars and motorcycles. Let's not forget that as a heritage of the British governance, cars drive on the left-hand side of the road, which makes life a little difficult at first, but by the time it's time to go home, you'll have become accustomed to it. The city is made up of three distinct parts. The seashore with its modern buildings and beach promenades, the old town, and the one-time Turkish quarter. The promenade is the site of folklore and art performances. The most beautiful and most important site of Larnaca is the St. Lazarus Church. According to John's Gospel, Christ resurrected Lazarus, who later fled to Cyprus and was the Bishop of Kition for 30 years. The church stands on his grave. Lazarus didn't find eternal peace in death, as his earthly remains were first taken to Constantinople, now Istanbul, and then to Marseille. All that remains of the ancient city of Kition is a not too large excavation in the northern part of Larnaca. The grave of Lazarus can be seen in the crypt below the church. The sign on his empty sarcophagus reads, Friend of Jesus. The church has a central nave, two aisles, and three domes, bears Byzantine and Latin marks, and is still in use today. Grandiose weddings and christenings are held here. The churchyard was a favorite burial site for foreigners, especially high-ranking Englishmen. Some researchers say that the name Larnaca stems from the ancient Greek word sarcophagus and refers to the tomb of Lazarus. Although there are many beaches and bays for bathing in Cyprus, the majority of tourists prefer Aya Napa. The resort is 40 kilometers from the international airport. The quiet fishing village started developing into a holiday resort in the 70s when some resorts came under Turkish occupation. The luxurious hotels of the area are a favorite spot for the former conquerors, the Brits, and lots of tourists come here from the chilly Scandinavian countries as well. Naturally, Cypriots living in the hills also like to come to the middle of the island for a vacation. Cypriots go to the small votive chapel on the beach to pray, while tourists looking for exotic sites go there to feast their eyes. During the 82 years of English dominion, many Cypriots went to England to study and work. Today, their descendants own many villas on the Ayanapa seashore. Naturally, 
The cosmopolitan city has all the accommodation, entertainment, and culinary opportunities that are expected from a tourist place such as this. If you're looking for a pleasant and carefree seaside vacation and don't want to worry about the weather, the sea temperature, or the cleanliness of the place, then Cyprus is the place for you. If you want to spice up your days spent sunbathing on the beach and swimming with short and relaxed excursions, then Cyprus is also the place for you, as well as for those tourists who are intrigued by the lifestyle and culture of the people of this distant island, its scenery, unique flora and fauna, and the artifacts of its exceptionally rich historical past, says the tour guidebook. An extra plus to the weather is the fact that there's no need to safeguard our towels on the beach. Crime on the island is virtually non-existent, except if a foreign thief happens to spend his vacation next to us. The main square of the city bears the name of the Nobel Prize winner Greek poet Seferin. The only real monument of Ayanapa is the 16th century monastery surrounded by a tall wall. Its foundation is surrounded by a legend. Some hunters were hunting in the nearby forest and their barking dogs led them to a small cave. In it, they found a freshwater spring and a Virgin Mary icon that had been hidden there several centuries ago. The settlement soon became a place of pilgrimage and received its name after that icon. News of the spring water performing miracles also spread quickly. The wall was erected against the Gothic buildings built of golden stones as protection against pirates. Its builders didn't know that the wall would not be able to protect the monks from the soon-to-arrive Turkish troops. We can hear Romeo and Juliet stories in several places throughout the world. The one in Ayanapa is less tragic than most. The father of a rich Venetian girl didn't let her marry her poor lover, so she moved into the monastery and lived there for the rest of her life. The building was left empty in the 20th century, then later became the guest house of the World Council of Churches. There are excellent four to five star hotels in the area, some of which were built in the 70s, but have been nicely renovated. In some hotels, you can have your own bubble bath with the apartment and step off the patio straight into the pool that connects the buildings. The sea itself is only a 100 meters away, but if you prefer swimming in fresh water, you can freshen up in the adventure pools of the hotel. In the evening, there are various activities with which tourists can amuse themselves. The hotel's restaurants are a real culinary experience, serving Greek, Mediterranean, and international dishes. Boat trips depart from the charming harbor of Ayanapa. These trips are almost compulsory on vacations spent in popular tourist destinations. Along the shore, you sail past small beach resorts, Nisi Beach, Marconisos, Derenia, and Protaras. Protaras used to be called Fig Tree Bay, after the tree standing by the tavern in the main square. It's almost unbelievable how much the area has developed. People in the hotels lining the shore can see the nearby islands from their balcony. These islands can be reached by paddle boat or rowing boats as well. Cape Greco is also a good destination for those vacationing in Ayanapa, as the view is simply spectacular from there. The administrative center of the region is Paralimni, with its 10,000 inhabitants. This is where locals take care of their everyday business. The city is also interesting for tourists, as it has a hospital, travel agencies, car rental companies, a customs office, police, banks, insurance companies, and airline offices. The buffer zone isn't far from here, and with a pair of binoculars, you can see the Turkish side. The boat sails past shores divided by beautiful rock formations, caves, and bays protected from the wind that are excellent places for solitary bathing. After passing rows of hotels, the scene becomes deserted. Boats are only allowed up to the buffer zone, controlled by the UN, where the end of the Greek territory is clearly marked by a flag. The leaders of the republic that became independent in 1960 overthrew President Makarios and put an extreme right-wing politician in his place, who openly proclaimed war on the Turkish minority of the island. 
The Turkish government, which had been waiting for an opportunity just like this, sent troops to the island and occupied almost 40% of it. The fragile peace that lasted for seven years was disturbed by gunshots during the Christmas of 1963. Good sense prevailed then, but when the extreme nationalist Greek junta came to power, it was only a matter of time till a war broke out. And in 1974, it did. President Makarios fled to London. The Turks soon proclaimed the Northern Cypriot Turkish Republic that has not been officially acknowledged by any other country in the world except Turkey. Due to this, tourists can reach the Turkish side of the island primarily from Turkey by boats organized by local Turkish travel agencies. Theoretically, you can also cross the border in Nicosia, but theories cannot always be put into practice. This separation of the island doesn't disturb the vacation of tourists, and locals also seem to have gotten used to the situation somehow. The UN comes up with different recommendations from time to time, but these are always turned down by either the Turks or the Greek opposition. The nightlife is bustling in Ayanapa during the season. The disco, restaurant, and bar owners strive to outbid each other with their ideas, so we can find jungles, pirate ships, and labyrinths made of mirrors. Shops close late at night, and there's an adventure theme park on the shore that stays open until midnight, where both children and adults can enjoy a ride on the roller coaster, the Ferris wheel, bumper cars, and other attractions. The capital, Nicosia, was also divided by the Turkish-Greek conflict, and since the reunion of Berlin, this is the only capital of the world split in two. The greatest of the city's sites, and we mean this literally, is the statue of President Makarios. The monument stands in the garden of the eclectic-style Archbishop's Palace built in 1961. Mikhail Muskus was born in 1913 and grew up in Kikos Monastery, Common goals brought him together with General Grivas Theodoros, who lived by completely different principles. The two of them fought side by side, though not always in complete understanding, against the British rule for the independence of Cyprus. England couldn't control the situation that was becoming an international embarrassment for the country and finally decided to give in. The independent republic was proclaimed on the 16th of August, 1960. The two communities of the country were represented equally, and the first president of the country was Archbishop Muskos, ruling under the name of Makarios. Makarios died in London in 1977, three years after witnessing the end of his dream. There's another statue in the capital 
that was built to commemorate the independence the island achieved in 1960. This spectacular work of art portrays members of the opposition, among them Macarios and General Grievous, being freed from prison. Unfortunately, by the time the monument was finished, the Turks had invaded Cyprus, and the island was divided into two parts, so the statue has never been officially given over to the public. The city is surrounded by a castle wall that is more than five kilometers long and has several watchtowers. The walls were built after the takeover by the Venetians in 1489. In those days, three gates were used to access the city. The gates of Paphos and Famagusta can be found in South Nicosia, on the Greek side of the border. Five of the eleven heart-shaped towers can be seen here. The Tripoli, the Davila, the Constanza, the Borocataro, and the Carafa. The old water trench has been neatly turned into parks, car parks, and sports fields. Laiki Gitania was once the red light district of the city. Today, it's a promenade with restaurants, galleries, arts and craft shops, and other shops. Its narrow streets have an atmosphere of eastern bazaars, and its cafes are shadowed by large trees. Venetian forts standing next to Gothic buildings with crescent moon flags flying on top. All this in the land of ancient classics. Turks, Greeks, and Armenians live here united in their love for their motherland. So wrote the Austrian Archbishop Ludwig Salvator after his visit to the island in 1873. Today we know that this idyll lasted exactly 100 years. After passing several small shops, we come to the main street of the city, the straight and narrow Litras. This is where Woolworth stands. From its tower, you can see the southern parts of the island as well as the buffer zone and the northern Turkish part of the city. The zone here is called the Green Zone. UN soldiers serve on the checkpoints. If you wish to cross over to the Turkish side, it's best to ask for information about the ever-changing conditions on the spot. Lefkara, lying at an altitude of 700 meters, is one of the main tourist attractions of the island. The women living in the mountain village have been embroidering tablecloths, bedspreads, and blouses for over five centuries. Their products are sold all over Cyprus and are also well known abroad. According to records, Leonardo da Vinci brought an altar cloth here for the Dome of Milan. The beige canvas on which the women embroider used to come from Greece, but nowadays it's imported from Ireland. The women draw by hand the ancient motifs they've learned from their ancestors and then start the embroidery that may take as long as two, two and a half months. Many of them work sitting on the steps or in front of the door of their homes. And while working swiftly with their hands, they strike up a conversation with their neighbors and potential buyers. Many of them speak English and have interesting stories to tell about life in the village, the traditions, and their everyday lives.
while women busy themselves with needlework, men make jewelry. Embroidered cloths and silver jewelry are sold together in the nearby shops. Other Cyprian specialties can also be bought here. All kinds of olives, halloumi cheese, and two kinds of sausages, only one of which is made from meat. The other one, the famous susukos, or sweet must sausage, is made by dipping walnuts and almonds on a string into boiling sugary must until it becomes as thick as a sausage. It's sold after it is cooled off and congealed a bit. Another famous product is the carob syrup, which is a cure-all syrup made from the fruit of the locust tree. It's used against stomach problems, for common colds, and also to strengthen a weak immune system. Locals only turn to the doctor after they've taken the syrup for three days without improvement. We can see how the fruit of the locust tree is processed and the syrup is made in the carob mill complex in Limassol. Another famous Turkish sweet is the lukumi that is also a product of Lefkara. Behind Limassol, at the foot of the Trodos Mountain, romantic villages are scattered around the slopes of the hills, Alassa, Platris, Omorhos, and Palandri. Perhaps the most picturesque of these is Lanya. Its Greek Orthodox church is humble on the outside, but hides lavish golden icons inside. The village is a famous wine-growing region where wine is made from grapes and schnapps from the pressed grape. The white wines of the region, Asprokrasi, are light, tasty, and semi-sweet. The red wines, Mavrokrasi, are heavy, thick, and sweet. The most famous wine is the Komandaria, a sweet port that originates from the Middle Ages and received its name after the master of the order. Komandaria is made from a grape that only grows in a handful of villages. There's a story about the leader of the Turkish troops, Selim Sultan, who, despite being orthodox, was fond of drinking. After consuming too much komandaria, he slipped in the Turkish bath and died. So please be careful when drinking komandaria and zivania. The latter is similar to the Italian grappa. It's a schnapps made of grape mark and is an excellent way to keep the skiers of the Trodos Mountain warm in wintertime. Villagers still use the huge and ancient grape grinders and wine presses and gladly show them to those interested. The atmosphere of Limassol, the second largest city of Cyprus, is Turkish rather than Greek. Besides the traditional fruit and grape processing, tourism plays an ever-growing part in the life of the community. 
This is where the ship carrying the fiancé and sister of Richard the Lionhearted was shipwrecked in a storm in 1191. The treatment that the princesses received prompted the king to disembark and avenge it on the Byzantine ruler. Richard and Berengaria were married in the chapel of the Fort of Limassol. Although at that time they didn't have video recordings, we can still see the event on film in one of the main attractions of the city, the so-called Time Elevator that was built in the Carob Mill complex behind the fort. The Time Elevator is basically a panorama movie with surround sound and moving seats. The cars in which we embark on our time travel move in accordance to the 45-minute story. Of course, we can see the resurrection of Lazarus and Aphrodite rising from the sea. After portraying the Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine eras, the film shows us how Richard the Lionhearted sold the island to Guy de Lusignan in 1191. This marked the beginning of the Frank era, which was followed by the Venetian rule from 1489. 1571 marked the beginning of the Osman era that was followed by English rule between 1878 and 1960. The rest is the recent past that can still be witnessed today. Opposite the time elevator is a huge shop called the Sea Sponge Center. We can see here everything and anything that the sea has to offer, as well as live performances. Because the sponges has this black color in the sea, it's like this one here. It's color the sponge. Otherwise, if we keep the milk 
with the sponge out of the sea, is destroy the sponge. It's come very hard. For this reason, we press very well. It's very difficult for us to bleach. After, we have to remove the stones, the shells from the root. Put in the bleach about seven, eight hours and destroy the stones and the shells. After, when we take it out, it's like this one. No stones, no shells in the root. If you, if we want to change the natural color, we put in the bleach. An incredible amount of sponges and sea cucumbers are on display here. These are later disinfected, whitened in a chloride solution, and then turned into bathing sponges. They also sell seashells and other shelled creatures, treasures found in the sea, souvenirs, and natural cosmetics made of natural marine materials. Among the items exhibited, we can find ship's propellers, petrified anchors, and 200-year-old scuba diving gear. Captain Cousteau himself smiles at us at the entrance. If you're looking for something more useful than the good old boring souvenirs, then this is the place for you. Curion, only 19 kilometers from Limassol, has been the most spectacular archaeological site of Cyprus since excavation started in 1880. The ancient city was already mentioned in Egyptian inscriptions in the 13th century BC. According to Homer, it was founded by soldiers returning from the Trojan War. The archaeological excavations confirmed the island's connection with the Greek mainland. There are signs that there was a cult of Apollo here. Corion remained a significant city, even under Roman rule, but due to multiple earthquakes later became desolate. From the seats of the theater nesting amid the slopes of the hill, you can see the surrounding landscape and the sparkling sea in the distance. Further interesting sites of the vast excavation can be seen in the former city center northwest of the theater. This is where the ruins of the 70-meter-long Paleo-Christian Basilica with three aisles and a christening chapel on its eastern side can be seen. The Nymphomaeum stands close to the old Roman Forum. This is where the well house and the indispensable public bath stood. Although it's hard to tell from the ruins, archaeologists swear that they have found signs of floor heating, pools with cold, lukewarm, and warm water, and many massage and changing rooms. The foundations, flooring, and magnificent mosaics of several ancient houses can still be seen today. Paphos is Cyprus's most important religious, cultural, and commercial center that used to be the capital at one point. The city today has only 30,000 inhabitants, but is extremely rich in ancient and medieval monuments. Perhaps Paphos Harbor is the most beautiful on the island. It's a colorful, bustling, pleasant Mediterranean harbor with lots of small fishing boats and lively traffic. The city was built around 1500 BC and was the seat of the proconsul in the Roman era. During the Crusades, it was famous for its shipbuilders and served as a sort of base for them, for shipping supplies from its warehouses to the troops. The city flourished once more in the Lusignan era, but then had to wait until today for another time of glory. In 1984, an airport was built east of the city that was suitable for servicing private planes and charter planes, which led to the growth of tourism. This is when hotels began growing out of nowhere and their upsurge can still be seen today. The old docks and warehouses have been turned into shops and terraced restaurants and cafes and the whole area is now focused on tourism. The harbor is so charming and the restaurants there are so pleasant that more and more young local couples want to hold their wedding ceremony there. What's more, 
People from England come here for their wedding celebration, and not only the descendants of Cypriots. All Cypriot girls receive a house from their father as a wedding present. Perhaps you're wondering why there isn't an endless row of overseas suitors. Well, according to some people, Cypriot girls come not only with a large dowry, but also with a large mustache. There's a saying in Cyprus that if a father has one daughter, he's happy. If he has two, he's nervous, and a father with three daughters simply shoots himself. The wedding itself is unlike any wedding in most European countries, albeit extremely practical. The wedding guests only receive a drink, the dinner, and partying that are considered normal in other European countries is unheard of. No wedding presents are given. Instead, guests bring along thick envelopes. The money the young couple receives this way and their savings are enough to furnish the house and also buy a car. Cyprus sets a good example not only in the way that young couples can start their life together, but in other aspects as well, such as education, health care, and the pension system. Let's hope that one day the leaders of other countries come to Cyprus not only to relax, but also to study the country. A small fort reflects off the water in the harbor. This was the tower of the castle that stood there in the Lusignan era and was destroyed by the Venetians. The Turks later fortified it and even placed some cannons there, but the English only used it to store salt. Today it's used as a gallery and lookout tower. The excavation area in the south of the headland begins 100 meters from the pier. The unique findings on display were found by accident in the 1960s. Some of the mosaics that used to decorate the villas of the rich in the Hellenistic era have almost completely remained. Mosaics were one of the most expensive forms of art in ancient times. They're probably of Eastern origin and have become popular in the whole region of the Mediterranean, in the Hellenistic, and especially in the Roman era. The composition of the mosaic pictures, the production and selection of the small, colorful, square-shaped stones and pieces of glass, the adequate preparation of the ground, the placing, fastening, and chiseling of the stones requires great expertise and tremendous work. Mosaics were built by workshops employing several dozen workers and slaves. The pictures usually portrayed themes or scenes taken from mythology, but in one way or another, they were always directly connected to the function of the building or the occupation or rank of the owner. The fact that not only important public buildings were decorated by mosaics, but also many private villas, leads us to the conclusion that in those times, several Neopaphosians could afford this fashionable, yet extremely expensive luxury. Of Cyprus-born Cytheria I shall sing, who gives gentle gifts to mortals, and on her lovely face always there are smiles, and a delightful bloom shines over it," wrote Homer in his hymn to Aphrodite. The goddess of beauty and love emerged from the sea by the shores of Petra Terumio. This romantic tale and the beautifully shaped rocks of the shore entices a lot of people to swim out into the sea and touch the rock of Aphrodite in the hope of eternal youth. I've never seen such an island of such female character, never breathed an air that is so dangerous and so full of sweet temptations, confessed the greatest Neo-Greek writer, Nikos Kazantzakis.
Trodos Mountain lies in the middle of the island. Its highest peak, the Olympus, is almost 2,000 meters high. Its gentle slopes face southwest. Many people who did not like the heat built their houses or vacation homes here instead of the seashore. The air is always pleasantly cool and balsamic, and the trees offer plenty of shade. English bureaucrats also moved here with their families and lived in great colonial-style houses with large terraces and took care of their official business from here. As they love to hike in the woods, we have to thank them for many tourist trails and paths that lead to wonderful sights. The purpose of the exhibition rooms, the screening room, and the pamphlets in the visitor's center at the gate of the Trotos Mountains is to show visitors the things that are worthwhile seeing on the mountain. This is all the more important as people who visit the mountain in summer have no idea what it's like in winter, and vice versa. The documentary film shows the changing of the seasons, the native wildlife, colorful vegetation, and offers a glimpse into the traditional life of the people living in the villages on the mountain. This is also good for business, because summer vacationers may become winter skiers as a result of watching this film. An interesting fact is that Rimbaud worked here as a headman on the building of the governor's palace. The then 26-year-old French engineer came to Cyprus looking for adventure and found the island to be poetic. We can see mufflins, foxes, and forest animals portrayed on film and also stuffed. There are no snakes on the island today, which is allegedly due to a whole shipment of cats being brought in at one point to kill these reptiles. Whether this story is true or not, cats are preferred to dogs on the island, as the latter allegedly once spread some sort of infection throughout the island. Maybe this is the reason that there are wild cats in the Trotos Mountains, yet not many dogs are kept in the houses. Dogs are only becoming popular pets nowadays. In ancient times and the Middle Ages, the mountainsides of Cyprus used to be covered with seemingly endless rows of cedar trees. The resistant, good quality hardwood was used to build boats, so forests became scarce. Luckily, they weren't destroyed altogether, and thanks to methodical replanting, cedar forests can be found in great numbers around the mountains. South of the 1,400 meter high Tripilos Mountain in Cedar Valley, there are some 40,000 cedar trees, all under strict protection. Several monasteries can be found in the area, surrounded by quiet loneliness. Although these are mainly visited by believers, they also welcome tourists these days. As entrance in short skirts or shorts is forbidden, people are given robes to put on at the gate. In bigger monasteries, this isn't an act of brotherly love, but of business. We can find these renta robes in bazaars and stalls selling religious articles in front of the gates of the monasteries. Of course, we can also get a map of the area in the visitor's center. If you're going hiking in the forest, make sure you take one of these with you. Where there are tourists, there are good restaurants. And where there are mountain springs, there's trout. And this means that in the hotels and restaurants of Trotos, we can eat delicious meals made of trout. If you don't like fish, you can ask for meat instead. Those with large appetite can eat a meza, which is a meal made up of eight to 10 courses. The meal includes the tarama, made of pink fish roe, the melanzano, which is baked eggplant in seasoned oil, and the tahini, a sesame seed pastry made only in Cyprus. Tzatziki is known by everyone who's been to Greece. You can eat dalmatis here as well, which is minced meat with rice rolled into grape leaves or stuffed into squash, peppers, or tomatoes. Olives and beans in sour sauce are also a must in these meals. A whole course is dedicated to the fruits of the sea, octopus, calamari, crabs, scallops, and fish.
Meats are represented by grilled or skewered lamb fillets and meatballs or meat dumplings. Comandaria goes well with the dried fruit and other sweet pastries offered as dessert. It all started with a single icon that the Byzantine Emperor Comenos gave to the hermit Isaias. The icon is allegedly the work of the evangelist St. Luke and portrays the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus. The monastery founded here, Kikos, became the richest monastery of the Orthodox world. It had estates outside of Cyprus, even in Russia and Asia. The monastery receives valuable gifts from rulers and clergymen even today. Compared to this, the income they generate from entrance fees is nothing. The wealth is obvious. Frescoes decorating the main entrance and the pillared porches of the two inner courtyards are made of solid gold. Visitors can see a small part of their immense treasure in the museum. The most valuable piece, though, the icon allegedly made by St. Luke and received by the hermit, is exhibited inside the church. Since the icon is covered by a silver plate, so that its beauty doesn't blind the person looking at it. The name Kikos itself is a type of ebony. The future archbishop and head of state, Makarios, was a novice in the Kikos monastery. The then called Mikhail Muskos coordinated the movement to liberate the island from under British rule. The two kilometer long road that leads to the top of Kiko mountain begins behind the monastery. The scenery is spectacular, but it's not only tourists visit here. Cypriots come here to worship at the grave of Makarios, buried here according to his will. Swallows nest under the archways of the courtyard, their twittering providing a pleasant background to the sound of the bell calling to litany. Believers have tied white ribbons onto the branches of the tree standing behind Makarios' grave to win the favor of higher powers. Many people also visit the huge white cross built on the hilltop that can be seen from miles away. An ever-growing part of Cyprus's income is generated by tourism, 
so the island strives to provide more and more activities, entertainment, and sporting opportunities for tourists. A professional 18-hole golf course was built on the hill above Aphrodite's Rock that attracts many, especially Brits, that really like visiting the island. There's also a luxury hotel on the course with a pool and a terrace offering a spectacular view. We can experience a whole new side of Cyprus if we visit the Argonaftis donkey farm. An old Bedford bus takes us from the mountain village of Kalokadara. Its cheerfully singing driver is almost as old as the bus. The scenery is beautiful. And even if we don't understand the words of the racy folk song, it sets a cheerful mood. This good mood is heightened by the welcome drink, Zivania, the famous local liqueur. The guide instructs the visitors on the basics of donkey riding. Now it's two or three things how to control. <laughs> the most important is to know how to start the machine. <laughs> it's very easy, don't worry. Yeah. You take it from here. You do like this. <laughs> now to go. Alright? You hit back. And you say Ella. <laughs> Alright? To stop. You pray. <laughs> Show. And back. Okay? Pull. This all the time is not good. They don't like. So this has to be free. Only when you want to stop. And back. Okay? Show. Alright? Because we're going to stop every five seconds. Then the tourists and donkeys size each other up. The donkeys are assigned to tourists according to size, from small to extra extra large. We learn that the fastest donkey is called Shumi and the naughtiest Osama. Meanwhile the continuously singing driver and his local helpers prepare to light a fire and make thieves kebab. Riding across the stream and through orange groves, we soon come to the Sindhi Monastery that was restored in 1997 under UNESCO patronage and earned the Europa Nostra Award. We arrive back to the farm, refreshed by the oranges we picked from the trees, to find the thieves' kebab, alias the souffle, ready to eat. To loosen inhibitions, a couple more bottles of zivania and wine are consumed. 
Later, everyone starts dancing to the well-known sounds of the Zorba. Cypriots, foreigners, everyone. Everyone.